but okay. uh, we can start. Maybe. Yeah, we can start. So, sorry. Welcome, everyone. My name is Daniela Osatsky Stern, and it is my pleasure to open this virtual event organized by the Holocaust Studies Program at Western Galilee College in Akko as part of the series we had started when the pandemic entered our life. We have three excellent speakers today who will share with us their research on the tragic yet important subject of Jewish children in the Holocaust, ghetto, camp, and forest. In his groundbreaking book, Ordinary Men, Christopher Browning quotes the rationalization of a 35-year-old metal worker from Bremer, Bremerhaven on his participation in murdering Jews on the Eastern Front. And I quote, I made the effort and it was possible for me to shoot only children. It so happened that the mothers led the children by the hand. My neighbor then shot the mother and I shot the child that belonged to her because I reasoned with myself that after all, without its mother, the child could not live any longer. It was supposed to be, so to speak, soothing to my conscience to release children unable to live without their mothers." End of quote. This monstrous rationale sounds so unbelievable to us, but in fact, it stood behind the horrific fate of so many children during the Holocaust, children who were subject to atrocities, abuse, violence, and murder. Through today's presentations, we wish to expand and deepen our knowledge of what happened to Jewish children in three spheres, in the ghettos, the camps, and in the forests. Our moderator will be our colleague and friend, Jan Bujlaf, who will introduce the distinguished speakers. Jan Bujlaf is a William Aikman Fellow for Holocaust Studies at Harvard University. Jan has published on pogroms and communal violence, visual history, and social relations during the Holocaust. His recent publications deal with Jews and non-Jews in the Netherlands, and social dynamics and everyday life around the killing center at Belgets. And he is now working on a new article that we can't wait to read. I would like to mention that we are recording the session and will upload it to our website. And please keep your microphones on mute. If you have any questions for our panelists, please write them down on the chat. As always, I want to thank Dr. Boaz Cohen, the head of the program, Chaim Sperber, Dr. Yaron Pasher, and Jan Bujlaf from the organizing team. And I would like to congratulate Adi Kantor, who is also from our team for, her, for the birth of her twins. So congrats, Adi. And it's so nice to see you all, so many friends. And uh, Jan, the Zoom is yours. Thank you, Daniela. Great to be with all of you. Welcome also on, on my behalf. Um, we have three excellent speakers, so we're really looking forward to uh, three wonderful, insightful papers. Uh, let's start with Agnieszka. Uh, I would uh, suggest. Um, Agnieszka witkowska Kritsch uh, is a graduate of cultural studies and Hebrew studies at the University of Warsaw and sociology. She did her PhD on the care of children in the Warsaw ghetto. And she's currently employed at the University of Warsaw and at the Jewish Historical Institute. Hello to our friends over there. 
Her interests span the history and culture of Jews in Warsaw and their impact on the city's identity. She has published a number of articles on the life and work uh, of Janusz Korczak and the institutions he led. She's the author of a book on the orphanage, precisely uh, entitled Let's Fear, Last Moments with Janusz Korczak. Uh, and the next book, based on her PhD, will be published by the end of this year. And we would also like to congratulate you on your uh, new baby. Um, your talk today is entitled Child Care Institutions in the Warsaw Ghetto, a talk all the more relevant that exactly 82 years ago today, the Warsaw Ghetto was closed. Thanks, Angesha, for being with us, and the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. Thank you for having me here. It, I, I really feel privileged, and thank you for the congratulations. Tomek, my son, is in the next room. <laughs> and for those who speak Hebrew, Tomek, when you puzzle, when you mix the letters, it's Motek, and actually it's very relevant because he is a sweet child. Uh, some of you know him already. Uh, let me just share my screen, which is always a challenge. So be patient and keep your fingers crossed. I've got the presentation here and hopefully it will be available for all of us. Uh, can you see it? Can you see it? Yes, yes. Okay, lovely. So now I just need to uh, make it be a little bit bigger. Oops. So as the as I was introduced and my lecture today was already introduced, I'm going to skip this slide because it's it's not uh, useful anymore. Uh, I'm going to speak about actually I'm going to present here some kind of a follow up of my PhD thesis that was defended in January 2021, so more than a year ago, uh, and I will actually I will use here two perspectives, a micro perspective, and I would like to speak about everything at the same time, which is impossible. So uh, that's just to, just to draw the background. But precisely, I'm going to speak about the orphanages that were located within the borders of the Warsaw Ghetto. And of course, some of those orphanages, you know by heart, as some of the figures, some of the heroes or people who are involved in the social care uh, of the children in the Warsaw Ghetto, you know very well, but there is a, the number of them is much bigger and hopefully uh, our, our meeting today will make you even more uh, conscious that we've got more than one Janusz Korczak, we've got dozens of Janusz Korczak in the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, first of all, I would like to show you the map of the Warsaw Ghetto, which is not very, very relevant, actually, but it comes from the original source. It's a gazette. It's a, it's a journal that was published in Warsaw. It's a Polish journal. And uh, that, th these are the borders of the Warsaw Ghetto that was created and closed uh, on the 16th of November 1940. Uh, of course, it's the it's the plan. Actually, it's the plan of the Warsaw Ghetto. The borders were changing, and the ghetto was shrinking. So here we've got the probably the the, the biggest surface of the Warsaw Ghetto. And for those who are familiar with the city, for those who are familiar with Warsaw, I can only tell you that uh, here on the on the top of the on the top of the drawing. Uh, nowadays, you can find a big mall that is called Arcadia. So maybe you visit it. There's also the, on the uh, on the um, southern part there is Palace of Culture and Science. So you see how long, how big it was. And on the right side, so let me uh, think it's eastern side. Uh, there is a <clears throat> there is the old town of Warsaw, and on the western side there is the Jewish cemetery. Um, the number of the people imprisoned in the Warsaw Ghetto uh, was about 450,000 uh, people, among them around 100,000 of the children. Most of them, most of them needed some kind of help. So how they were helped, that's the main question of our today's meeting. And um, we can share those uh, activities. We can we can divide them into a few a few groups. And first of all, I would try, I would like to start from the 
actions that were rather scattered and occasional. Those were the activities uh, that were um, uh, undertaken because of an occasion, for example, or in a very, very small scale. And first of all, those are the donations that were given to the children. And here we've got the picture actually from, from London and from, from England, from the uh, from the Imperial Wall Museum, but the picture was taken in the Warsaw Ghetto. And we've got here the beggar, the, 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 the beggar sitting on the street asking for some kind of some kind of help. And this, I mean, it can be also considered a, a, as some kind of help, but we cannot say it was organized, it was long term, and so on and so forth. Then after we've got another type of help that was uh, another uh, that was to some point organized to some scale organized uh, but it was again rather uh, it can be rather considered as a charitable activities and those are the house committees uh, actions that were undertaken in particular houses and those are mostly the collections of money collections of food uh, and also collection of clothing and those things were then passed to the people in need very often to the children. There were also a few actions, big uh, propaganda actions, I can also say, like uh, month of the child, that the first month of the child in the ghetto took place in the summer 1941. The second one was planned for the next year, but because of the starting, because of the, because of the great liquidation action that started uh, in the summer 1942, it never, it never, it never occurred. And we don't have many uh, visual documentation that can tell us more about uh, helping children in the Warsaw Ghetto, but I've decided to show you this. This is a um, Mittelskarte, uh, the Lebensmittelkarte, so the food coupon that was distributed among the residents of the Warsaw Ghetto. And I'm not going to speak about the card, but I would like to draw your attention to, to the to the slogan that is printed here. Uh, the poor and the homeless child is starving and freezing. So all of the time, most of the time, uh, the residents of the Warsaw Ghetto were um, told or well remembered, were remembered, were told to remember about the children who are living, who are, who are living in the ghetto and who need some kind of a, of a support. And here I would like, and here that's going to take a longer moment because it's, I'm very proud of this table because I've, when I was uh, working on my PhD and I was thinking about those uh, issues connected with help uh, that were undertaken uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto and their, uh, that were directed to the children, I decided to divide them into a few categories. And there are actually two dimensions, two things. First of all is the time, how long for how long uh, the help was planned. And we've got here short-term and long-term activities. Then after those activities can be divided um, in reference to the, to the scale, let's say. There were activities that were covering only one, one thing, one need, let's say. Those were those one-dimensional support actions. Then after multi-dimensional support, activities and full support like food, lodging, education. So every need of a child was covered somehow. And we've got here different types of institutions, different types of activities. And let's start from those short term and one dimensional activities. And those are only uh, examples and please remember that it's not perfect. I mean, the, the table is not, not perfect. There are also activities that is very difficult to put them uh, into any of those uh, cubes from the table. So we've got uh, as short term and one dimensional support activities, we can uh, point here the children library that was opened in 1942 and it operated till the beginning of the great liquidation action. And we can see, I mean, it was focused on books covering the educational needs of the children. And as we can see, it was working only a few months and it was not um, 
it was not accompanying the children. It was only, uh, it was only kind of um, actional uh, initiative. Children are coming, borrowing the books, going home, coming back. It was not, it was not very, uh, it, it was not like an institution that was uh, always with the child. It was only for a moment. And one dimensional support, but realized in the long term, uh, we can point here soup kitchens for the children. Uh, the initiative that was called Drop of Milk, Tipat Halaf in Hebrew, you still have those stations, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so the stations that were um, offering to the children uh, some kind of um, food support, milk, especially milk and those special things that children are, 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 are eating. And then um, there were also some kind of school and night uh, shelters for young homeless beggars. And you can see here, like soup kitchens were providing the children with food. Schools were giving only this kind of education or um, you know, spending time with the children, but without food and without lodging. And also those night shelters uh, that were providing the children, especially the, the, the street beggars, only with, uh, with bed for one night or two nights. Then after multidimensional support realized in a short term, term uh, perspective, those were the Jewish police detention rooms. Uh, the children found on the streets, they were located in the detention rooms led by the Jewish police. There were six houses like this uh, in the Warsaw Ghetto. And from there, after um, feeding uh, the, the, the child, after giving him or her a lodging for a longer moment, a week sometimes, uh, the charges were transferred to the orphanages. And you can see the arrow <laughs> to the orphanages. Then after we've got uh, multidimensional support realized in a long-term perspective, and those were the common rooms uh, for the children, mostly for the children of resettlers and the children of refugees. Then after the daily shelters providing food and educational program, um, like only during the day for the night, the children were obliged to go back to the so-called punkten, so to the points where the refugees and the resettlers were located. We are going to, to speak about it further, and I'm very glad that Dr. La Price is with us because she is the specialist on this topic. So if, if she would like to add something, I will be more than happy to listen to her comment also. Uh, then after we've got another type of institutions that were providing full support in short or in long perspective. So full support like food, lodging, education, and also some kind of health care was provided, for example, in the, in the children's hospital that was operating within the borders of the Warsaw Ghetto. That was the Bersons and Baumanns uh, Hospital. The building of this hospital will become one day, probably next year, I'm, I'm not sure, so, but probably next year will become the museum of the of the Warsaw Ghetto. Uh, this uh, hospital, it's an amazing story. And of course, I'm not going to, um, to, to speak about it too long. But if you would be interested in providing uh, help, support, healthcare, and also in, um, in being with the children till the end, that's, that's one of those institutions that should be considered. And uh, last but not least, and actually the most important topic of our today's meeting are the orphanages that were providing full support like food, lodging, education, sometimes also health care, because in most in, uh, in the orphanages in the Warsaw Ghetto, there were, uh, there, 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 there were medical personnel employed. And everything was um, planned as a long term uh, action, as a long term activity. And here I just wanted to, to show uh, a picture that shows the refugees and resettlers who are coming to the Warsaw Ghetto. And I just couldn't resist to use the quotation from Dante Alighieri, the Divina Commedia, which is Lasciate ogni speranza, voi entrate, abandon all your hope, you who enter. For many people, this uh, actually, actually this quotation uh, could have been 
kind of a motto because what happened behind the wall of the Warsaw Ghetto uh, was actually for most of the people who were imprisoned there actually unbelievable, completely unbelievable. And what were the stages of despair? Uh, I will speak about the refugees here for a moment before I move to the to the orphanages, because I, I just wanted to show you what was the what were the uh, points, what were the milestones of their uh, being of their presence in the Warsaw Ghetto. People who were relocated to the Warsaw Ghetto first they were put were um, imprisoned in kind of a. a kind of a prison, I would say, in a quarantine that was located outside of the Warsaw Ghetto, actually, that was located on the street Leszno number 109. And they spent the first days uh, in this quarantine building uh, without the permission of living. So they were staying there locked like in a prison. Then after they were moved to the so-called Punkten, to the points, to the kind of shelters, very often organized in a in a hectic way in a places completely um, not relevant let's say uh, in, in in a future slide in the further slides you will see those places also and they had to organize their their life from uh, scratches uh, there was also in the warsaw get up place, an area that was called the town of refugees. Um, it was called the town of refugees because of the fact that the number of those punkten there was very high. And those were rather big institutions um, that were hosting dozens or even hundreds of people. And uh, let's, I, I'm not going to read those quotations. You can uh, take a picture or a screenshot of it, but uh, let's let's focus on the last one for a moment. It, that was located on Stavki 19. There are 1,200 refugees in here. 112 people died within a month, including 42 children. This place is completely neglected and looks like a huge ruin. Most of those punkten, of those points, of those shelters, were completely irrelevant for the needs of the of the new settlers, newcomers, and the, and the refugees. But some of the activities were undertaken also for the children, and one of the examples are the soup kitchens, and uh, that were located in many places in the Warsaw Ghetto. In a moment, you will have the addresses. So if you are interested in the topic, you can always, uh, you can always um, delve into it. I mean, it's, it's extremely interesting. There are some documents. There is a documentation uh, speaking about this particular uh, initiative. But let's focus for a moment on the children's kitchen number 127 located on Stavki 36. And I've got those data from, from kind of a report of a person who visited this place. And what was the situation there? No glass, no brushes, no clothes, no brush, no fan, damaged stoves, poor sanitary conditions, broken boiler, and the soup is diluting from the, from the jars. Lunches are issued on forged cars, uh, incorrect accounting, disappearance of products from the warehouse, frequent staff changes. And the room, the room is unheated. Lunches are eaten by the parents of the children. That was a huge problem of the soup kitchens for the children because the children were sent to those places, but they were told not to eat there, but to bring the food to the to the parents or to the to the shelters. And um, here we've got the picture that was actually taken before the Warsaw Ghetto was created. This picture comes from the uh, spring 1940, so more or less about half of the year before the Warsaw Ghetto was, the, the borders of the Warsaw Ghetto were closed. And from one of the accounts that uh, are uh, stored in the, in the archive of the Jewish Historical Institute, uh, we can find uh, a kind of a report of Stefania Halberstadt Arkinova, who survived the war, but who had the chance, who had the kind of a privilege to work uh, in such a soup kitchen. 
have a look uh, what they were doing there. Have a look how the soup kitchens were slowly but surely transforming into some kind of kindergartens or common rooms as they were called. The poorest children from small towns, children of people with no home or property were staying in the common rooms. The children were fed there and taught songs and games as was as writing, reading and calculation. Our meetings were held in cramped rooms, unhygienic due to overcrowding. We've got the addresses of those soup kitchens that later were transformed into uh, common rooms, if, into a places where children were not only fed, but also educated in uh, some way. What the caretakers were thinking about the children, about the situation, about the places, and about their role uh, in giving any support to the children in need. Again, I'm not going to, to read everything, uh, but you can see that the voices are uh, different. They vary from each other. The first one is rather optimistic. Everything is fine. The rooms are large and bright and so on and so forth. But the third quotation, uh, you can see that there is nothing. There is lack of water. The stairs are slippery with mud. The air is more deeply intoxicating. So uh, while reading those accounts, while reading those uh, memoirs um, or documentation, actually those texts, they come from the Ringelblum's archive. You can see that we can we can all see that the that the conditions varied, but in most cases they were very they were very difficult. And what about the children? What the caretakers were thinking about their work? Um, some of the children uh, came to Warsaw two years ago. Some of the children uh, came a little bit later. Um, you can, I am reading the first quotation from Novolipki 76. These children are dirty, sick, apathetic, and there is no way to catch their interest. So the caretakers, uh, the ladies, the teachers who were with the children were rather, um, were rather helpless uh, in light of the situation. But the, the, another one from GK3, from the town of, uh, from the town of refugees, uh, she underlines another fact. She says that the case of orphans is particularly tragic. So while speaking about the orphans, we are slowly moving to the, to the, to the orphanages. But before we go to the orphanages, let's uh, have a look on the, on the place I mentioned it before, on one of the punkten. This one was organized in, in a synagogue. And you can see the children lying uh, on the benches uh, in um, probably without any special help, just put there as they came. So what to do with those children? What the caretakers were thinking about their role and their, let's say, vocation or in the future. So one of the girls from Novolipki 25, she says that she starts her daily work with clean, cleanliness check. She wants to know if the children who are coming to the common room are, in a, are, are clean and without lice and so on. Uh, they start the day from washing. Uh, another lady, uh, the third quotation from Novolipki 76, uh, She's rather, um, she's rather uh, complaining about the situation and she's underlining the fact that she is left alone with the, with the children. For several months, I have not been receiving a penny for any games, material for handworks and drawing sewing threads without which I cannot conduct systematic teaching. I cannot fill the whole time of work in the common room only with singing, talks and games because the children, and that's important, are too weak and must also, also sit, not stay and play, but also sit and rest a little bit longer. One of those girls also left us the account uh, with, such a, with such a sentence that till now, I mean, I'm dealing with this topic for a longer, I've been dealing with this topic for, for years, but every time I read this quotation, it's, it's I, I feel the shivering on my back. 
I was only making dying more pleasant for these pale children. So they realized they already knew that the situation is so difficult, so harsh, and probably uh, it's rather impossible to change it for to change it for better. The only thing they can do is to make uh, their dying more pleasant. Uh, the situation has changed. The Jewish community, the Judenrat of the Warsaw Ghetto, uh, realized that something has to be done and uh, some actions were also undertaken. And the program uh, of care for the children of refugees and displaced persons changed a little bit uh, at the turn of 41 and 42. Some of the new orphanages were created and some some of the children were moved from the Punkten uh, to the orphanages and they were provided there with rather more specialistic help and uh, more complex one. Unfortunately, most of those institutions, especially those uh, created for the newcomers, for resettlers and for the refugees, uh, were deported at first at the beginning of the uh, Great Liquidation Action in the summer 1942. And here's the quotation that, again, uh, makes me uh, thinking about the situation of a child. Is it good to be a child? Not really. I don't know. I forgot. But I know it's worse to be a Jewish child. And it's even worse to be a Jewish child, poor and orphaned. Janusz Korczak, whom you all know probably, wrote this at the beginning of the 30s. But probably then, uh, he, he, he didn't realize what is going to happen soon, what is going to happen to, uh, to the, the children, that the Jewish children who are poor and who are orphaned, but who would be put uh, in the prison, a kind of a prison which uh, undoubtedly was the Warsaw Ghetto. And I'm going to speak more about Korczak because I, I, I thought I decided that you are probably familiar with the story and that's not going to be still boring for you, but I'm, I'm, I will also move to the other orphanages, to the other institutions. So, so this, the orphanage of Korczak created uh, at the beginning, I mean the beginning of this institution, it started in 1912, but um, I will, I'm going to speak about the wartime. So the building, the Korczak's orphanage, was partially destructed in September 39. Uh, they had to move to the Warsaw Ghetto as the original building uh, was not located within the planned borders uh, of the Jewish district, let's say. Uh, of course, uh, they uh, experienced severe deterioration of living conditions. They, the, the buildings they obtained later were smaller. They had less income. The children were rather hungry. Uh, they were um, getting infected. And they, of course, didn't know what is going to happen with them. Uh, they had to move twice. I mentioned that already. And um, the last location, I don't know if you see the my mouse, my cursor, it's here. That was the last location, more or less, uh, of the orphanage of Janusz Korczak. The number of the children was increasing from nominally 107 to more than 200. What they were doing in the orphanage, they were trying to preserve the pre-war organization and the style of living. They were trying to keep working the internal institutions. They were trying to uh, commemorate the Jewish festivals. Uh, they also organized something that we would call homeschooling today. Uh, they were praying, they were, um, they were uh, celebrating Purim, they were celebrating Hanukkah, they were also celebrating Pesach. And while speaking about Pesach, I would like uh, to underline the fact that during the last Pesach, they staged uh, in the orphanage uh, a play of the Indian author, Indian um, writer, uh, Nobel Prize winner, uh, Rabindranath Tagore. And um, the, the play was devoted to death. It was, um, it was a nice, delicate story about the Indian boy who is waiting to die. Uh, it was staged uh, in the orphanage um, twice. At least we know that it was staged twice. First, uh, firstly, uh, during Pesach 1942, and secondly, more or less a week before the great deportation, great liquidation action started. 
This orphanage, but not only this orphanage, but uh, this especially was accepting newcomers. I mentioned already that uh, nominal number, nominal number of places for the orphans in this orphanage was 107. At the end of the day, in August 1942, let's say at the day of the deportation, the number of the children under, uh, under care, under supervision of this very orphanage exceeded 200. And uh, which is also somehow moving uh, is the fact that even in those harsh uh, conditions, um, the teachers, the caretakers in this particular orphanage were trying to speak about the experiences of the children. And um, I'm not going to speak about it further, but it's a lovely collection of 24 micro histories that were collected uh, in 1941, 42 in the orphanage of Janusz Korczak. And those, um, were, uh, those were the, the experiences of the children of the war newcomers. They were dictated to the educator, handwritten and then typed. And uh, actually don't look at this uh, picture. The, the picture is, it come, that's the first page of the diary of Janusz Korczak, but mo more or less the, the documents looks uh, more or less the same. They survived with the diary of Korczak and they are now kept in the ghetto fighters house, uh, not far away from, from, uh, from your place when the, when the, where, the, where our um, today's meeting is hosted. And then, yes, but not only Korczak, and that's the point that yes, I would like to, I'm how so many minutes? Uh, yeah, uh, maybe one or two minutes. Please. Okay, I will be fine. Thank you. I will be fine. So Korczak, you all know, but there were more orphanages. The biggest one located in Jelna 39, 500 children. The one that was deported first, located in Ogrodowa 29, uh, the one that was evacuated from Umschlagplatz and was given the chance to live longer, so to say, located firstly on Twarda 27, they moved to Milna and they moved to Wołyńska somewhere, we don't know the number. And the one, the last one I'm going to speak now, is the one that was known as the heaven on earth uh, that was located in Jelna 61, created only in uh, 1942. So, where the children were helped. You've, here you, we, we all have the, uh, the ghetto, original ghetto map with the dots, with the little red dots uh, of the places where the uh, orphanages, the ghetto orphanages were located. And you also can see the relocations. And here, for example, we've got the orphanage of Janusz Korczak, who 33, moved to another place to, now it's the Palace of Culture and Science, more or less. Uh, so, so that was the relocation that took place uh, in the in the autumn 1941. And here another very interesting uh, um, orphanage for the girls. Uh, that's the orphanage that was evacuated from the Umschlagplatz. The girls were given the second chance to leave, uh, and they were moved to another uh, building previously uh, inhabited by the children in Milna, on Milna 18. And then after they were moved to Wołyńska, we don't know the exact uh, number of the building. So this is the, this is the orphanage that was led, directed by Maria Rodblat, the mother of, uh, of Jurek Rodblat, who was Lute, one of the parties. Lutek, Lutek. Lutek Rodblat, excuse me. Uh, Lutek Rodblat, they Sipin. both, Yes, they both, they both died. They actually, um, let's say, they both died uh, on Melna 18 uh, during the Warsaw Ghetto uprising. Mila, Mila. So, but but you can see how uh, how developed was this help. And um, for those who are interested in the particular place or particular story of particular place uh, in the book that is going to be published by the end of the year, um, all of the micro histories uh, is presented. And here I would like to say thank you for your attention and show you uh, the picture that I found uh, in Israel in Yad Vashem uh, archive. 
three years ago when I uh, spent like two weeks there, that was a research uh, fellowship. I have never seen this picture, but it was taken in 1942 uh, in the orphanage located in Zegarmistrovska, very difficult to pronounce, uh, 14. Uh, for the children, also for the children of newcomers and refugees, and uh, look at the look at the children and look at the caretakers. They they don't know what is going to happen. They are still some of them, at least most of them, actually. They are smiling and they are still believing that the that the life is going to continue. So I would like to thank you here, and uh, I will be more than happy to answer to your questions. Thank you so much, Anjecha, Anjecha, for your really powerful and I would say very moving paper, especially with the uh, visuals. Um, I'm sure there are many, many questions, uh, so please continue to put them in the chat box, as always. Uh, let us now move to the second paper tonight. Uh, we're delighted to have Dieter Steinert with us. Dieter is Professor of Modern European History and Migration Studies at the University of Wolverhampton in the UK. He has published widely, I will just cite two uh, recent uh, books. One is called Holocaust und Zwangsarbeit, Erinnerung jüdischer Kinder, 1938-1945, published in uh, 2018. And a forthcoming one with Katar uh, China Persson uh, on Prisnova concentration camp, the camp children trials in 2022. He has received the prestigious Yad Vashem International Book Prize. Of course, he's known for this in, in 2020. And he's also known as the co-organizer of the following conference series, Beyond Camps and Forced Labor, which is forthcoming in January, uh, and Children in War, Past and Present uh, in Salzburg. Dieter's paper today is on testimonies of Jewish child forced laborers, challenge and opportunities. Dieter, wonderful to see you as always. And as the saying goes, the Zoom floor is yours. Thank you very much. I try to share my screen and... I see that my technical abilities are not strong enough to do that somehow. Or do you have to make me a co-host? I think that you are already a co-host. So maybe you can try again, share a screen. No, there is no, well, I can do it without any. Okay, thank you very much for your kind introduction. and. For, for having me here. And I, I would start at the end with the liberation of Auschwitz on the 27th of January, 1945, when Soviet troops liberated this camp, they found around seven and a half thousand Jewish and non-Jewish prisoners, many of whom, as we know, were seriously ill. Approximately 650 of them were younger than 16 years old. And among them was Piero, born in November 1928 in Rome. A few days before liberation, Piero was sent on a death march, but the prisoners made it only from Birkenau to the Stammlager. When they arrived, the SS had already left the camp, and so did the guards who had marched Piero's group to Auschwitz. The survivors thus looked after themselves. Exhausted, ill, and surrounded by corpses, they ate whatever they could find. They melted snow to quench their thirst and to cool their wounds as the booming of the battle came closer. On January the 27th, when it was Piero's turn to fetch snow outside the building, he saw a Soviet soldier dressed in white who initially drew his weapon but then quickly grasped the situation. Piero remembered that there was no storm of enthusiasm, but instead total apathy. Nobody was able to cheer, and it took some time before the survivors realized that they were free and started to weep. At liberation, Piero weighed only 38 kilograms. He remembered that he had to carry corpses into a cellar room before he was taken to a hospital. Quote, they treated me. My way back, it took me nearly a year before I returned home. But that is a completely different story. Today they say, well, it happened, but life goes on. No. Life stops. Then it starts again. 
A new life begins, it is no longer the same. A different life that too can be happy. However, it is a different life that all of us can live by taking all the pain from the previous life with us. I think I have finished. And with this remark, Piero completed a story about Auschwitz. The survivors of the Shoah, like Piero, were shaped by external and internal wounds, scars, disabilities, or traumatic experiences. They had lost parents, family members, and friends. Child survivors had often lost any trust in adults as well. Over months and years, their life had been characterized by the vicinity of death, forced labor, hunger, thirst, and humiliation. Many had been sexually abused, some had to endure forced sterilization and medical experiments. In general, only children whom the Germans had regarded as useful laborers had a chance to survive the camps. My lecture, as Jan um, said already, is based on a research project on Jewish child forced laborers 1938-1945 which was published in a German edition in 2018. And there hopefully will be an English edition in not too far future, at least I'm in the queue of, the, of, of Yad Vashem and I hope uh, that the English edition will be published in hopefully a few years time. Three areas of research have been of particular interest. Firstly, the experience of war, forced labor, and the Holocaust as constructed and narrated in former child forced labor's testimonies. Secondly, the participation of German civil and military institutions in deploying Jewish children. And thirdly, the various interdependencies between Jewish child forced labor and national socialist ideology, occupation policies, and the Holocaust. Jewish children work in all branches of industry, in mining, agriculture, and construction work. They were forced to build production plants, bridges, roads, and railway tracks, barracks, airfields, defensive position and trenches for the German military. Over weeks, months, and years, years they had to carry out exhausting work, often way beyond their physical strength. The total number of Jewish child forced laborers is unknown. Statistics just do not exist. Estimates depends on the, depend on the definition of childhood, which varies in literature between 12 and 18 years. Most recent research tends to follow the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child, stating that, quote, a child means every human being below the age of 18 years. And that's what I have followed, this definition I have followed in my research. Using this age limit, it is safe to say that several hundred thousands of Jewish children, probably more than a million, had to endure longer or shorter periods of forced labor before they were liberated or more likely before they were murdered. My first part will be on the testimonies, my second part on resilience. In his path-breaking work, The Death of the Shtetl, Yehuda Bauer told the reader already in the very first line that, quote, this book was written as a contribution to the victim side of Holocaust history. The events happened to real people whose stories must be heard and analyzed, end of quote. Memory and remembrance are central categories that characterize and define Jewish life and Jewish identity which explains the important role of testimonies in documenting the Holocaust for future generation. This, however, has not always been the case because, as we know, the role of survivors and the role of their testimonies have changed dramatically since the end of the war. 1929-born Fritzi, who after the war emigrated to the United States, reported during an interview that over many years, she had kept her memories for herself because she wanted to live as a normal young woman. It was her son who finally forced her to talk, quote, and this is when the memory started to fall back into place. This is when I went back into the camp and started to relive all of this, 
The reason I'm telling you this, because many things are blocked out in my mind. One of the things is crossing, crossing the threshold from the train station into the camp itself, end of quote. Such blackouts caused by trauma are quite common in children's testimonies. Fritzi was not the only survivor who simply could not remember what happened between leaving the train and entering the camp. Historian Joanna Michlik spoke in this context about a lack of precise references to time, space, and social actors. In a 1999 article, literary scholar Andrea Reiter stated that, quote, children not only experience the camp in a different way, they also remember them differently, end of quote. She char characterized the children's perception as naive, but exact. Social scientists and psychologi psychologists agree that children have a much longer lasting memory of cruel scenes, but also of friendliness and support received during that time in the camps and during forced labor. When analyzing the testimonies, it soon became obvious that only a few child survivors centered their story around forced labor. This had certainly to do with the fact that most interview projects have focused on the Holocaust in general or not on forced labor in particular. In such Holocaust-centered interviews, the fate of the family was most important and how the interviewee had survived the omnipresent of death. A number of child survivors put their accounts on forced labor into the context of physical mistreatment, inadequate clothing, and a lack of protection against injuries and toxic substances. The lack of protection caused not only blisters, but also, for example, mutilations, burn of the lungs, and other lifelong damages. This happened in particular in the ammunition firms near Auschwitz and in other German occupied areas. But there are also stories about work in the camps and the often life saying function of such internal work. Children came to these desired positions with the help of well-meaning, but also often not well-meaning adults or by their own initiative. Work within the camps protected the children better against the weather. They had not to endure the often long marches to the outside workplaces and the beatings on the way. Work within the camps made it easier to acquire additional food and clothing and sometimes it enabled them to come in contact with family members in other parts of the camp. Most popular was the work in the kitchen, the transport of food, the so-called mobile cart commandos, and the position of runners. The letters served at the gates and delivered official messages. However, there are also opposite views, saying that it was better to leave the camp for work than staying inside. Many testimonies clearly demonstrate that child survivors cannot be regarded as passive objects, but rather as active individuals. Nevertheless, for most children, adults played a vital role in their survival. When adults close to the children disappeared, be it that they had been deported or murdered, children often were left without protection in the camps. Some became quickly apathetic and mutated to Muslims while others had a chance to recover once they had found a new close contact, a new adult, or a new child. Psychologists talk about pairing and grouping in the camps and regard this as essential for survival. Surviving without pairing and grouping was hardly possible. Also, we find remarks about such close contact persons in most of the testimonies. It would be wrong to conclude, as we know, from this that the camps were characterized by solidarity only. In the camps, children and adults alike were confronted with daily violence. Children's testimonies contain manifold information about both what children witnessed and what they had to endure themselves. This included hanging and shooting, beatings, homo and sexual abuse of boys and girls by adult Jews and non-Jews of both sexes, to name just a few. My second point is about resilience and survival. 
In many testimonies, survivors reflect about the reasons why they have survived. Such individual thoughts can hardly be generalized, and it seems that so far international research has produced more questions than answers about whether children or adults have greater resilience. Was it of advantage or of disadvantage to be young? Can children adapt easier to a specific situation than adults? Do children have a stronger willpower? Could children cope better with traumatic situations than adults? Or was it just pure luck that some prisoners survived the ghettos and camps if you that 1927 born other favored in his testimony. Pure luck. From the day of liberation, child survivors became objects of psychological studies. It was most difficult to find coherent results as Judith Hammerdinger and Robert Quell stated in their study about the children of Buchenwald, where some 900 children have been liberated by the US Army in April 1945. Quote from their study, uh, for the most part, they were viewed as damaged beyond hope of repair, of recovery, of normality. Some mental health workers considered them a psychopath, assuming they must have been selfish or manipulative or mean-spirited in order to survive when so many others died, end of quote. However, this group of children from Buchenwald have produced rabbis and scholars, doctors, surgeries, businessmen, artists, and a Nobel Prize winner. Some children regarded their youth as a main factor for survival. Others referred to their adaptability and the learning process necessary to survive a concentration camp. By and by, you get experienced. 1929, born Halina reflected about her time in Majdanek. Your instinct sharpens, your vigilance increases, re your reactions speed up. You learn to distinguish between exhausting and less exhausting work units. You learn to bribe, end of quote. Anita, who was 14 when liberated in 1945, slaved from one day to the next. She was obsessed to survive and had the feeling that there was a strong force in her to succeed. Liliana, who was at the same age, compared herself with the greedy she-wolf, emaciated, egoistic. Quote, I had no female body anymore. I was one of the ugliest women. Really ugly, almost dead. But still alive, alive, alive and determined. A day has passed again and I'm still alive. A night has passed again and I'm still alive. I do not want to see anything. I do not want to watch. I do not want to know. Egoistic, closed up, lonely, lonely, very lonely. End of quote. For some, it was their faith that helped to survive. Others did not deal with it at all. An expression 1929 born Zara used in her testimony. For her, it was important to watch, accompanied by the will to tell later about her experience and her suffering. The desire to talk about their experiences dominated many survivors' accounts. Some told their story immediately, others later when the years of silence had passed. Some were only able to talk to their grandchildren, but not to their children. Some former child forced laborers suffered feelings of guilt all their life. Nessa, who couldn't stop, couldn't stop crying when liberated, always cried in her nightmares as well. And then she felt guilty that she had survived. Quote, was I better than my friends and my cousins and my buddies and my uncles and my aunts and my father? Was I better? And then I was sitting there and maybe I cried for me because I was all alone. End of quote. The testimonies demonstrate that with liberation, a new st story began, a story that wasn't free of conflict and wasn't always positive. And the liberating combat troops have moved on. An unknown number of girls and boys alike became victims of sexualized and sexualized, sexual and sexualized violence conducted by members of all allied military forces. Those who returned home 
were rarely able to meet members of their families, but they often faced new antisemitism and violence. Most survivors entered a world that over many years was not willing to listen to their stories, but looked at them with suspicion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dieter. Um, sure, there will be a lot of questions as well afterwards. Uh, let us move to the third and final paper tonight uh, before we go into the uh, Q&A uh, session. Uh, Leah Preiss uh, is the Spiegel Thanks. Research Fellow uh, at the Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research at Bar Ilan University in Israel and currently a fellow of the International Institute for Holocaust Research at Yad Vashem. Leah wrote her PhD dissertation at the Institute of Contemporary Jewry at the Hebrew University. And her thesis dealt with the impact of the refugee problem in the city of Warsaw and its ghetto uh, between 1939 and 42. Other topics of interest include the daily life of East European Jews during World War II and their personal writings. She has published 28 articles and reviews and edited seven books, five diaries and two memoirs. Her much praised book, Displaced Persons at Home, was published by Yad Vashem in 2015. Today, she will talk about Jewish child combatants in partisan units. Leah, great to meet you, first of all, and then the floor is yours. Thank you. I just have to see, see if, okay. Do you see? Yes, yes. You can see. yes, it's okay. Perfect. Okay. First of all, thank you all organizers for inviting me and uh, for a very interesting, for me, a very interesting conference. Uh, though I heard uh, Professor Steiner uh, not far, I think a month ago, and the subject about the refugees and their orphanage is well known to me. That makes it most and uh, more important and uh, more uh, interesting. Now I'll go to my topic. Uh, we are dealing today with Jewish child combatants in partisan units. And I would like to uh, start with a letter that was written in October 1943. It, it was written in the forest of the Naliboki forest in uh, Belorussia to the Kremlin. And I'm quoting. To our dear comrade and beloved, I don't see, just a moment. Uh, to our dear comrade and beloved father, Yosef Vosarianovich Stalin, on this day of our celebration, the day of the opening of our pioneer camp and school, we ardent pioneers, members of the uh, youth movement, the communist youth movement, salute you, our leader and teacher. In the course of two years, which in our eyes were like many decades, we were behind barbed wires. We were suffering at the hands of the bloodthirsty beast. Before our very eyes, our parents, brothers, and sisters were brutally murdered. We were bloated from hunger. We attempted to obtain food at railway station. We looked under railway cars to find scraps of food that were thrown there. There are some little heroes among us, that's what they wrote. Out of three, 350 children who were brutally murdered in the orphanage of the Minsk ghetto in April 1943, only three survived, Misha, Ziyama, and Mula, who are now with us. Many of us who left our partisan units became guides through the forums and by their actions, saved hundreds of Soviet citizens. He meant Jews, but that's the, the way they used to say, instead of Jews, the Soviet citizens. The writers appended two poems to the letter. One was about the mass murder that took place in the Minsk ghetto on November 7, 1941, the day of the revolution. The second poem said, time will come for our revenge and so on, for our destroyed children, childhood and for our anger and so on. The letter, the letter was signed by 41 children who were far from the Soviet realm and were organized in pioneer groups in partisan unit uh, number 106, led by Semyon Shalom Zorin located in the Baranovich region. 
in Belorussia. So what was Unit 106? Oh, here. How do I, I don't know. Yes, it's okay now. It okay? okay? Yes. So Thank what was Unit 106? Who were these children and what was the connection between the two? Unit 106 was a Jewish partisan unit, a family camp that was under the command of Semyon Shalom Zori. The unit was established in the spring of 1943 and operated originally in the Staro Soleil, Staro, Staro Selo forest, 20 kilometers from Minsk. And then in, they moved because they were chased. They moved to the Naliboki forest in a deep red over Russia. Its founders, came from the Minsk ghetto mostly, but not all. And their first step in rescue in, 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 and in fighting began while they were still imprisoned in the ghetto. After they had personally experienced persecution, abuse, and witnessed the mass murder operation there. Some background of, uh, information about the Minsk ghetto and the uh, foundation of this uh, uh, camp, uh, family came. In early, in early August 1941, in Minsk ghetto was a crowded about 75,000 to 80,000 uh, Jews residents. Uh, on November 7th, as noted above, after a number of sporadic murder operations, the German carried out a huge mass murder in which 12,000, between 12,000 to 15,000 Jews from the ghetto were shot to death. And on November 20th, 1941, the German murdered another 5,000 Jews. In retrospect, it turns out that these murders were intended to make room in the ghetto for Jews deported from the Reich, the German Jews. On March 2nd, 1942, the evening of holiday of Purim, the mass murder was renewed in the Minsk ghetto. This murder operation was particularly bloody one because many Jews attempted to flee from their pursued and seek refuge. According to German sources, at least 3,400 Jews were killed in this operation, while other testimony, testimonies indicated a, large, a much large number. Uh, on July 9, 28 and 29, 1942, another mass murder operation was carried out in Minsk ghetto. This great pogrom, as the Jews of the ghetto uh, used to call it, uh, it resulted also in the number of total of 10,000 Jews. One of the places, one of the places to which Jews from the Minsk ghetto were sent to work was the camp set up in Shirokaya Street in the city itself, where Soviet POWs and other Jews were incarcerated. This place later became a transit camp for people uh, being sent to the examination camp of Sobibor and some of the, um, uh, the, the, the those who made the revolt in, Sob in Sobibor, the, the Russian Jews came from Shirokaya, from this place from this camp. Another Jew who was sent from the ghetto to work in the Shirokaya camp was the, camp, the carpenter, Semyon Zorin. Uh, Zorin was born in Minsk in 1898. Uh, from 1918 to 1924, he was a soldier in the Army in 1921. During the Russian Civil War, he was wounded twice. At the end of 1941, after one of the murder operations in the Minsk ghetto, Zorin escaped from the Shirokaya camp, which was known for its cruelty to its inmate, in order to join the partisans who were operating in the Staroya Selo forest. At, the time, at that time, partisan activity was increasing and becoming more effective in the forests of Belorussia. In early 1942, the underground in Minsk began to strengthen its partisan units in the forest with people with military experiences, and Zorin was one of them. For all this time, Jewish escapees from the Minsk area, mainly from the ghetto, continued to stream to the forest. Some of them escaped on their own, others with the help or at the initiative of, Jewish, of the Jewish underground. 
However, Jews were not readily accepted into the partisan ranks. Fierce anti-Semitic sentiments based on, based on prejudice played a role in the rejection, along with the fact that many of the Jewish escapees were unarmed. Furthermore, a large proportion of these fugitives were children, youth, women, and old people, all of whom lacked military training. In addition, it should be stressed that the general partisan headquarter in Belarus and the Soviet authorities that supervised it did not pay adequate, the, the adequate attention to this, the special situation of the persecuted Jews. Zorin, after he escaped, made the decision to establish a separate Jewish unit when he first met or came across frightened Jewish children in the forest who had fled the ghetto and sought shelter in bars and other deserted agricultural structures. In accordance with the order of the central command of the partisan movement, Unit 106 was divided into two. Every partisan movement, every family camp was divided. One is a fighting unit and the second is a family camp. At the end of May 1943, the population of the unit of the 106 unit uh, was 110 Jews, of whom 25 were fighters. About two months later, in early July, there were 315 Jews, of whom 45 were fighters, and so on and so on. And in January 1944, it was reported that the unit fighting force numbered 137 Jews with holding weapons, including 16 women and 25, they say students, men, children, or youth. While in the family camp, there were 556 Jews, of whom 218 were women. As noted before, the fighting group included dozens of children and youth from Minsk, surrounding, in the Minsk and the surrounding area. From the age of, I'm speaking from the age of six to 12, but they were also younger. Most of them were orphans or were on their own for other reasons. The main assignment that was given to them was to be messengers and liaisons from the partisan unit to the Minsk ghetto and with their, with their mission being to, and their mission was to smuggle out from them, from their boat people and equipment and to guide the escapees through the forest to the partisan in the, in the forest. They were guides. White children. Due to their young age, people were not suspicious of them and or considered them as a threat. And therefore, they were able to operate with relative freedom. In addition to their natural daring, their ability to run away fast and their familiarity with the area. Also, the majority of them were without close, uh, uh, close supervision of parents or other family members and felt gratitude and sense of obligation towards those who had given them shelter. So they did what they asked them. All this transformed them into a central element in the, fight, in the partisan fight to save Jewish life. Here's Smolar, who was a, a member of the, of the underground in the Minsk ghetto, a communist, he wrote a book after the war, he, was, he survived, and he wrote, in the ghetto, a new world circulated with great secrecy. It sounded like a password. It was the kids, or in Hebrew, in Yiddish, Dardakim, Dardakim. It was known that those who led people and brought them to the forest were children. Who were they? Only a few people knew about this. Smaller wrote that Semyon Grazenko, Gnazenko, who was the uh, Belarusian uh, commander of the, of the partisans in, uh, in Belarusia at Forest, personally brought to his bunker three Jewish uh, youth and gave them precise instruction on how to get to the ghetto, how to act, and how they should, uh, and what, do, what they should say to the people that they would bring them 
uh, uh, to the partisan uh, forest, uh, partisan areas. One of the young messenger was Sima Le, Sima Fitterson from Minsk. She was 12 when the war broke out. She escaped along with the, along the gate, she was escaped from the ghetto to the forest in March, 1943, because she realized that her life was in danger. When she arrived in the, at the village to her good fortune, she met Zorin and his second in command Feldman. And that is how she joined the unit. A number of accounts of courage are linked with little Sima. Some of them were related by adults who were part of the unit 106, and some were related to later testimonies. And she was quite famous in Belarus after the war. In the partisan unit, Sima learned, among other things, how to use a pistol in order to commit suicide in case that she was captured. She said that during the time she was with the unit 106, she brought six groups of the Minsk ghetto to the forest, and each group had about 20 Jews, whom she succeeded in leading to safety. Sima made use of her small size and childish appearance and resorted <clears throat> to various tricks, like playing with a ball to distract the Nazi authorities from what she was doing. In her testimony, Sima later noted that her name as a guide to the forest and as a messenger of the underground became known in the ghetto to the German who would be looking for her when she, the ne when she next uh, came into the ghetto. Therefore, the leaders of the, under, of the partisan unit ordered her not to return to the ghetto, however, since they could not without her abilities. She continued to play a crucial role, waiting for the escapees outside the fence and accompany them to the forest. The phenomenon of children and youth who were as, who were as guide or who were guide was also mentioned in testimony given by a man of the unit under the six, and I can give more uh, examples, but I would like to uh, uh, go on. Uh, despite the fact that they were given very dangerous missions that involved responsibility for the lives of others, these children and youth were watched over like the apple of the eyes of the leaders of the unit, though. Who they were very concerned, the leaders, very concerned, concerned with the needs of these young people and organized them for organized for them an educational framework according to their age. And alongside the, the pioneer political organization that was required for the children use, because it was a this family camp was a, a communist a, a unit. Uh, so they had to uh, uh, set up a, a, a communist uh, uh, youth movement. Um, alongside the pioneer political organization that was required for the children and the youth, the, the youth uh, unit established a school for 70 children along, although it lacked any equipment and curriculum as to be expected. It was like a, the, the curriculum was the, like the Soviet uh, Russian schools, albeit it was supervised by uh, accredited teacher. Uh, Anna, uh, Anna Segelson testified that in addition to the usual task that she had to fulfill, she was uh, teaching those children. We had no books, no paper. In winter, we used the bark of the tree trunks and wrote with coal in summer, we wrote on the ground. The main question that naturally arises in this connection is whether the leaders of the unit acted correctly when they sent children and young people into life-threatening situation. Should they have made these children into soldier, competent soldiers? This kind of question, of course, are asked from a later historical perspective. One that examines th a thing from a point of view of normal life, and of a decent social order. However, in the context of war and genocide, in which social and normal norms were not operated, and children like adults were condemned to death because they were Jews, 
it was natural that there were changes in, the, in their behavior and in their views of themselves and of their surroundings. When they arrived in the forest, many of these Jewish children and youth were not much different from the Jewish adults. They had ceased being dependent and helpless. They had already amassed a great deal of experience and understood what they, what they faced from the enemy and how to deal with them. They knew also how to make use of their relative advantage over the adults. It was also clear to everyone that the fight to save the life of Jews was the highest priority. And for this effort, all possible forces had to be mobilized including children and young people. Furthermore, it turns out that the results were not disappointing. They fulfilled their mission well. Approximately children, approximately hundreds of children, women and men found protection. I think about 700, uh, more than 600 found protection in the Zoe unit and survived to see the day of liberation. Many of those later testified how important a role the young people, the children, played in their rescue. Can we consider those children as soldiers? In partisan combat is a, if partisan combat is a battle and partisans are fighters and soldiers, then those children and youth in Unit 106 were undoubtedly soldiers as well. Thank you. Thank you so very much um, for, again, really powerful uh, a talk that really opens a, a variety of, of, of topics and, and, and questions that we can like, we could potentially go into if we had four hours uh, of Q&A. Um, I have been collecting some of the questions, so I think I would just uh, point them out uh, chronologically. Um, so the audience so far, and please continue writing your questions in the chat, have been really moved by, by of, of course, by these three uh, perspectives, very moving, revealing, as as uh, Phil said in the in the chat box, really the true horrors of the persecution come through the, the lens of children, precisely. Um, this closer look that you, uh, that all of, all three of you provide. Um, I will start the question because that's the first one that came in for Agnieszka about, um, uh, more on uh, did any children survive? How did you track those children um, that you saw and the, the, re the research process you went through from archives, collecting testimonies? Um, and Michael asks, incidentally, uh, are you, some of your work, is it published in English? Because he only could find uh, Polish uh, uh, work. Okay, let's start from the children then. <laughs> so, of course, the the number of the children from the institutions that I was dealing with, the children who survived is rather very low. Unfortunately, there were no uh, funds, connections, um, and also I would say rather also will to uh, organize the transfer of the children from the orphanages to the institutions outside or to the private places. Some of the children did survive, and uh, one of them actually was, uh, I, I'm speaking precisely about this person because some of you may have known him, that was Shmuel Gogol, uh, that was the charge of uh, Janusz Korczak's orphanage, then after he was transferred to the orphanage that was located in Gensia in, in the Warsaw Ghetto, then after, as he was already rather older uh, child, he was a teenager at that time, uh, he was transferred to Auschwitz. And from Auschwitz, he survived uh, the, the camp. In Auschwitz, he was also playing in the Auschwitz Orchestra. He was um, playing the mouth uh, harmonica, Mapuchit. In Mapuchit. Hebrew. Yes, so he was playing the uh, the mouth harmonica. He survived miraculously, almost. And after all, he uh, he lived for many years in Israel. He was also a leader of children's orchestra, uh, harmonica orchestra, mouth harmonica orchestra. So that's one of the examples of a person of a child from an institution 
who uh, who survived but it's it's one of not many examples there is another boy also from the orphanage of uh, Janusz Korczak who survived the deportation only because of the fact that during the deportation during the moment of deportation he was absent he as one of the uh, oldest boys uh, was working outside of the ghetto uh, and at the moment of deportation, he was uh, simply not there. When he came back, he realized uh, that there is no one. Uh, he was able to survive the Warsaw Ghetto, then after he emigrated to South America, and I had this uh, amazing experience a few years ago when I was still working uh, in Korczakianum. The lady uh, at the age of 80s, I guess, at that time, who came to Korczakianum, she was looking for the information uh, about Korczak, and she told me that she's the wife of Jakubek Boim. And Jakubek Boim was one of those uh, boys, uh, a, a few boys from the orphanage of Janusz Korczak who, who survived the moment of deportation. He was the one who survived the ghetto, the war, and so on and so forth. Uh, of course, a lot of, a lot, it's never enough, but some children survived the ghetto, but these were not the children from the institutions. Those who survived, I'm speaking statistically, of course, it's, it's, it's it, I'm not speaking about the cases, of course, there were some exceptions, but most of the children who survived the Warsaw ghetto, there, they were the children of the families who had some, funds, contacts, and friends on the so-called Aryan side, or at least they knew someone who, for example, knew Irena Sendlerova. Irena Sendlerova also appeared in the questions. So, so those were the children who somehow, whose families were somehow ready to organize the transfer and to sometimes also subsidize uh, the, um, the the time of the child in in a family in a so-called new family or in a in another orphanage like for example some of the children a few of the children from the Warsaw Ghetto uh, were installed in uh, in the biggest orphanage in the in the home for foundlings so to say for the Polish children that was called the house of the priest Bodwen Dom Księdza Boduena so. Some of the children from the institutions did survive, but not many. More children who survived the Warsaw Ghetto, those were the children who had families, who were able to organize the transfer, who were able to subsidize um, the transfer, who were also able to, to, to provide the money for the, for the stay of the child outside of the ghetto. Yes, and the books. Well, <laughs> in the English versions. So the book that was uh, already mentioned, the book devoted to Janusz Korczak was published only in Polish. That was my master thesis. And um, probably it will not be translated into English. But the second one, uh, the, the one devoted to the orphanages in the Warsaw Ghetto that is going to appear, uh, that is going to be published by the end of, the, of this year, uh, I, I will do my best to uh, translate it into English, not by myself, of course. I mean, there, it needs a professional translator. So it will be, I, I will do my best to translate it into English and to publish it uh, in English. Of course, it, it demands time. It, it needs time and some, yes, some, some, some more effort. Uh, but I would love to do that. And I think that uh, that's gonna be enough as the history of, uh, orphanage of Janusz Korczak is also included in the bigger one, in the in the book uh, devoted to the orphanages, all orphanages of the Warsaw Ghetto, so more than 20 of them. Yes. And I just saw um, that there's another question just came in for you. Uh, did you come across any documents that refer to Warsaw Ghetto hunger study? I mean, the book 1946 reported on studies on children, but are there any hints on this project in documents other than this? publication, that's Camelia asking this. Mm -hmm. uh, I know the book, uh, the, the book that was published in 1946, uh, and I know the history of the of this project, of this research, pro research project. Uh, I'm not sure if I have read anything on the preparations to this project or 
uh, anything about the, the whole thing that was uh, written after the war. Uh, if Camila, if I'm not mistaken, if Camila can reach me, I will do my best to find, oh yes, yes, I can, yes. So if Camila can uh, write to me, I would be more than happy to help. I will, I will find, some, if, if there is something, I will find it for you. I know that there were other researches conducted, like medical researches conducted in the Warsaw Ghetto. For example, the wife of uh, Ludwig Hirschfeld, Professor Ludwig Hirschfeld, Hanna Hirschfeldova, was also, was also uh, conducting a research with the children uh, in the Bersons and Baumanns Hospital, but it was not included in the book. It was published as a separate article right after the war in one of the medical journals. So if, uh, if Camilla is interested, I will be more than happy to, uh, to, to, to send it to you. All right. Well, that was uh, responded in live. Wow, that's really, that's, you can only do this in live sessions. Uh, then um, a question for Dieter, I, because I didn't see any particular question. Um, so I'm, I'm going to ask mine that really um, haunts me right at the moment as well. Uh, you mentioned a lot of times the term res uh, resilience. Uh, are there any you know, hints of child experience that might be particularly uh, 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 relevant for, for children's experience versus adults experience, for example, in, in camps and ghettos that you mentioned? Um, how would you understand the the idea of resilience and using it in, in our studies as a tool as a concept do you think it's it's useful would you can suggest other perspectives and uh, uh so that's that, that would be my question well that's a very very open question and uh, in in a huge area of, of research uh what i have limited myself to what was was just not to generalize questions of resilience maybe it will be possible in 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 10 or 20 years time by 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 others but what i could do and what i have limited myself to do was just to collect how children perceived their own survival and and their own uh, resilience that, that's the last part of, of of the book and and i clearly stated to the reader that I'm not going to generalize that. Other parts of the book, I, I followed what historians normally do, generalize on the basis of, of accounts and, and testimonies. Uh, but, but in that part, I've restricted myself and limited myself not, not, not to do it. Um, that is really, uh, I think that's a really useful reminder for always... Uh trying to stay as close as possible to the uh, archival evidence, especially when we have these very broad uh, concepts. Um, then uh, there was one question uh, that I'm going to combine with another one uh, for Leah on, on sources. Um, what sources, uh, how did you go about collecting them, um, specifically about the, the child experience and, and child documents about children? Because they really uh, rarely left any any written traces during the war, uh, in the post war they were again uh, between these whirlwinds of of continents and moving and mobility, and uh, foster care. So, how what were some of the challenges you encountered in documenting and finding documents and and trying to convey this in a in in, in your narrative? Lea, please unmute yourself. No, I was going to say. Uh, yes. There we go. Uh, okay. Uh, first of all, most of the people who belong to this uh, family camp survived. And uh, first, most of the, the, the sources were in Russian, were collected uh, in, uh, in Russian, excuse me, uh, in, in, in uh, Belarusia after the war, because they consider those partisans, those combatants, uh, a very important uh, um, subject. So they, um, they interviewed them and they wrote those because most of them, in comparison to the Bielski, Bielski, you know, the Bielski uh, family camp who didn't uh, stay in, uh, in Europe, most of them went either to Israel or to the States. 
the case of the Zorin family camp, most of them remained in Russia, in Belarus. And they uh, interviewed them. They gave a lot of um, testimonies and uh, many documents that were given. The, the, the letter that was, um, that was sent to the Kremlin, I think those, the, the leaders, the commanders who survived, kept it because it was very important after the war to show that we are, we were very, uh, uh, we, we were very loyal to the, to, the, to the party, you know, because this, this was, you have to remember that this is, this was a, a, a communist uh, a unit and the place where they were uh, relieved, uh, uh, the place where they were in Belarusia was a communist state. So they kept those uh, documents that was important to them uh, and, they, uh, and it was kept in the, in the archives in, uh, in Belarusia. And the other same has most of those uh, documents. They got it from uh, the uh, archives in Belarusia. Secondly, there are a lot of uh, testimonies. Part of them came to, uh, immigrated to Israel, but very, very, not, not immediately. It took, it, uh, Zorin himself uh, immigrated to Israel in 1972. He didn't leave any, uh, any documents, any interview, any testimony. He, he, I think he passed away a year later. The fact that they didn't give a lot of testimonies uh, played a role in the memory of their memory, of this unit's mem uh, the, the memory, in the, in the public memory. They are not known as the, um, as the uh, Bielski. The Bielski uh, was, was written a book about them, the Bielski camp, uh, family camp. The Zorin family camp is less known because most of them remained in Russia and when they came it was, anyhow, uh, there are a lot of testimonies that they gave. Uh, I, I saw so somebody ask about Sima Fitterson. She immigrated to Israel. She gave testimony to Spielberg, for example. Some of them gave to Spielberg, some of them in Russia, some of them in Israel. There is a lot. So I collected all the, all the records and I um, find, uh, and there were books, for, for example, her smaller, he wrote a book about it, and he wrote, he, he told, he, he, he described the, the, the heroism of the children, of those children who were in the, uh, in the family camp. All right, thank you very much. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, as tradition, uh, goes. Uh, thank you again for these wonderful three papers and uh, have the last word for Boaz uh, Cohen, as always, uh, the head of the program. Thank you so much. It's so great to see uh, these friends, you friends, and hearing your presentations. I always learn so much from you. And the uh, I would start from the end. I have, uh, I'm teaching this year, as every year, a course on children in the Holocaust. I also teach a, I teach a course on rehabilitation of children after war and Holocaust. Uh, so the rehabilitation research is good. I mean, there are a lot of problems and like uh, Dita talked about what children were suffering from, uh, how they were looked at after the war. But in the end, there's a happy end. But when you teach children in the Holocaust and the people are asking you, are there survivors? And the answer is not so much. I mean, talking about the family camp is, we have survivors, we have the people. It, it, it's a, there's a happy end. Even the children that uh, did their interviews, uh, used their interviews and their materials, these are the children who survived. But actually, uh, this story of children in the Holocaust and the fact that, like Daniela said in the beginning, there are so many examples like this, that this is 
rationalize as something that you have to do. Uh, I, I've always dreamt of, I'm working on a paper called the war against the Jewish child. Was there a war against the Jewish child? I ask my students this, my answer is always the same. Yes, I'll show you that there was, that it was an issue. It was an issue that was discussed there were, uh, about which policies were made. This was not only a rationalization on the part of the uh, end user. This was something that we went along everything. So maybe we'll have a chance to speak about this too. Uh, but I will uh, say some things that are happy endings. Uh, we are a, we are having a, and we are starting now to, uh, I don't know if you are seeing this. Yes. Uh, we are opening a register application process or registration for our third year of a, the innovation entrepreneurship course for Holocaust memory. And we've had two years with amazing uh, people uh, from BA students from Switzerland to uh, in Poland to a uh, senior scholars, a uh, senior faculty or at least faculty. And uh, we've had many projects discussed and some projects are actually out. And uh, this is open to everyone in the world. Like this is totally open. If you're willing to commit to the process of building a project, it's a project-based learning course. And if you are willing to commit to this process, and if you have students, young people who are maybe interested in this, we'll send on the same mailing list of the conversations, We'll send a, a we'll send a full uh, program uh, of a, 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 we'll send a full uh, publication of the on this to everyone with links. If you took a photo now, like I saw of this uh, thing, there's a barcode in the on the bottom, and it sends you to the uh, to the opening page of the. Uh, to the website of the of the process. So we have a, this is coming out, tell your students, tell your friends, ask yourselves if you want this. It's a, we had people from more than 14 countries in the last two classes. And uh, it's really, a, it's a unique project and it's, meant to keep memory alive with new projects, low-tech projects and high-tech projects, but new innovative projects uh, that people are developing in the course. Uh, now, uh, although this is not us happy endings, I will also say that we also have a, the next uh, month's event is already will be already online now, uh, in a minute, now you can see it. Now we are going to the really hard part, hardcore Holocaust here. And uh, we are having an amazing team with Natalia Alexiou as a respondent. And uh, you will get, of course, the uh, mails about this and it's always you can also know that everything that we do is on our a uh, on the page you registered so if you registered on the not through the link uh, you register through the record conversations page of western galilee then you can see all the recordings of the former events of the last two and a half years uh, other recordings are there. So now the, this recording will go up on that page in a few days, but actually we have uh, recordings going back and it's an amazing resource which you are uh, uh, welcome to use. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Thanks to the speakers again. And uh, we'll... Uh, Meet again, hopefully, keeping the memory of uh, the Holocaust alive. Thank you.
Thank you to everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. It was very, very interesting. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye -bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you.